You are listening to Stories Behind the Songs with Chris Blair. For more information, check out chrisblair.com. Hey, everybody. In this episode, I'm sitting down with another one of my great friends, Kent Blazy. I have known Kent for, gosh, 17, 18 years now, probably, and uh, he is just an incredible, incredible songwriter, but more importantly, he's just a great guy, super humble, always down to earth, and uh, I just love him to death. Um, He's written so many of some of my favorite songs. I am a huge Garth Brooks fan. Garth is actually the guy that got me into music in the first place. Garth was the reason I moved to Nashville to pursue music and um, Kent has written so many amazing songs for Garth. Let me just give you some titles that he's written for Garth and and many other artists. Ain't Going Down Till the Sun Comes Up, Um, Getting You Home, The Black Dress, Chris Young, If Tomorrow Never Comes, It's Midnight Cinderella, My Best Days Are Ahead of Me, She's Gonna Make It, Somewhere Other Than the Night, Uh, You Can Let Go, That's What I Get For Loving You, can't get enough the patty loveless song i mean it's just i could go on and on and on Uh, i love this guy so much and i can't wait for you to check out this episode let's get to it this is stories behind the songs with chris blair and my guest this week kent blazing hey everybody this is chris blair with another episode of stories behind the songs and today i am sitting here with my buddy kent blazy kent so good to have you. Honored to be here. Man, it's uh we uh we have known each other for a long time. You have played the listening room since the very beginning. Exactly. In Franklin, which every, a lot of people think of the beginning of Cummins Station. Um, right. but you've no, you've Franklin. actually been here since the beginning. Yeah. So and I'm so proud of what you've created oh, and man. it's a wonderful place to play and uh, great staff. So Thank you. Oh, I, it's it's my honor, man. It's uh, love love what we do. So yep, yeah, exactly. Well, for all the listeners and everybody watching, let's just go back to the beginning. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, just kind of like, what what made you decide like, you know, I've got to do this music thing. Well, we'll go way back. Let's do it. I was actually born in Woodstock, New York, before it was Woodstock, New York. But even back then, it was an artist community where you had painters and writers, the Hudson Valley painters, a lot of them were from there, and uh, people would come up from New York City that were actors to do the playhouse. So as a little kid, I'd go to people's houses and somebody would be working on a huge painting, and uh, I was like, that's cool. Or, or somebody would go, I wrote a book, you want me to autograph it to you? And even back then I thought, now nah, that's a good way to make a living. And my dad worked for IBM, and he always said, you know, don't do what I did. And uh, he was very supportive of me. And back then, IBM meant I've been moved, so we moved to Lexington, Kentucky, <laughs> and that's pretty much where I grew up. And um, but I always took that thing of being self-employed and and doing something artistic, just from because that's the what Woodstock was. And my sister was an artist, a photographer, and uh, so kind of in high school, I started writing poetry and. St- and uh, some of them would end up in the high school yearbooks or high school newspaper. And so it's like, well, somebody must think these were okay. So it wasn't the Beatles that got me into wanting to have a guitar, it was the Birds. Yeah. And that 12 string guitar of Roger McGuinn's, mm. I'd never heard anything like that. And so uh, I started asking my parents for a guitar. And of course, uh, they got me like most parents did back then and probably still do the cheapest, hardest to play guitar yep. you ever could get in your life. Now, the newer ones are way better for kids starting out, but back then they were terrible. But so I immediately- Hard stu- steel strings. Hard just steel make strings you bleed. about that high yeah. off the neck yeah. and uh, your fingers did bleed from it. And um, so it was one of those things where the minute I got it and kind of learned some chords, I thought, well, you know, I've been writing these poetry things. Why don't I put some lyrics to the songs and started doing that. and. Some people in other bands heard him in Lexington and liked what I was doing, asked me to join bands, and then some other bands started playing my songs. And so I was like, well, I must have a little something if these people are doing it. And um, then I just went out on the road, kind of like you did, you know, and came pretty close to a record deal a couple times. And another group that was doing my songs came to Nashville through Harry Warner at BMI, and they were pretty close to a record deal, and they got beat out by a group called Wild Country. 
who turned into Alabama. Yeah. And so I didn't feel too bad about that. Yeah. But Harry was very encouraging. And then I played guitar for a guy, Ian Tyson, up in Canada. He's kind of like the Canadian Bob Dylan. He wrote Four Strong Winds and Someday Soon and some things like that. And so I was his band leader, and he would let me open his shows with his band but play my songs. And he was very encouraging mm. and said, you need to get down to Nashville. And uh, so I was kind of getting tired of the road, as you know. And um, so I went home from playing with Ian for a couple of weeks and a friend of mine, Sonny Lemaire, is in the group Exile. And they've always been friends of mine being from Kentucky. And they had a new guy in the band, Mark Gray. And Mark was this amazing singer, songwriter, piano player. And so Sonny said, well, you know, play him some of your songs. So I played him and Mark said, you need to move to Nashville. So I had two people telling me that. So the minute my wife got out of grad school in Bloomington, Indiana, we headed down here and, and dug in. And I was very lucky the first year and a half I was here, I had a top five song with uh, Gary Morris on Headed for a Heartache. And yeah. I thought, this is really easy. I got like six songs recorded in two weeks. And I thought, oh, I got this. Yeah. And then, oh yeah, you got it. <laughs> and you, you so let's go. So what what year was that when you moved here? 1980. 1980. The fall you got, of 1980. You got it. If I remember right, you got a publishing deal. Yes. And then and then that publishing company closed while that while that song went to number five. Correct. Right. Yeah. And uh, actually, the publishing company had already been closed, and so the guy I wrote it with Jim Dow, who'd been uh, running the publishing company, he kept the publishing on it, and so that was good for him. And the funny story was. Jim was a great athlete, and so back in the 80s, uh, there were softball teams for every record label. And so there was like 20 record labels at the time, and they all had their teams, and it was very competitive, and Jim was a great athlete. And so um, Gary Morris was on the same Warner Brothers baseball team as he was, and uh, so he pitched him the song on, on a cassette during a baseball game, <laughs> and uh, Gary ended up cutting it. and. It's like, oh, okay. You never know how songs are going to get exactly. cut. Exactly. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, uh, early '80s, you're in town. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're starting to write a lot. Mm -hmm. You meet a guy by the name of Bob Doyle. Bob Doyle was at ASCAP. Uh, encouraged me to come over to ASCAP when "Headed for a Heartache" was a hit. I was with BMI, and BMI paid about half of what ASCAP paid. And Harry was at BMI, which was the reason I went there. So I switched over, thanks to Bob Doyle, to ASCAP and met him and we became friends. And that was probably 84 or 85, something like that. Yeah. And he was early on uh, in management as well and had you, uh, he introduced you to a, a, a little unknown demo singer. Well, actually, he was a cleaning church and, and uh, selling boots guy yeah. when yeah. I met him. And, uh, Bob called me up and he said, I've got this kid and I know you've got a demo studio. Would you start using him on some demos? And I said, yeah, bring him by. And then I found out that Bob had quit ASCAP to manage this kid. And so I thought, you know, Bob Doyle quitting a job at ASCAP, this kid must really be something. And so he brought him over and um, they played me six songs on a cassette and I loved what he was doing. I said, I'd be glad to use you on demos. And when they were leaving, Bob said, well, he writes a little bit too. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, he's cleaning churches and selling boots, you know, I'll write with him. And uh, so we set up a writing appointment for about four months later, which I'm going, why did I wait so long? Um, and the first song that we wrote together was If Tomorrow Never Comes. And I thought, this kid's like 25 going on 50. and. Uh, we became close friends. He became my favorite demo singer next to Trisha Yearwood. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden he went from uh, cleaning churches and selling boots to being Garth Brooks all around the world. It, I feel like it was almost like being around when you were a friend of the Beatles or something. Yeah. You know, one minute it's one thing and the next minute it's just a totally different thing. Yeah. And the cool thing about Garth is, and this doesn't seem like it happens much in the music business anymore, we're still friends, we still write, you know, we still hang out, and that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know him well, um, but the, the handful of, you know, six, eight times that I've been around him, he is always like you hear the stories, but he's he's always been super genuine like that. 
He at really least to is. Me. I mean, you know, he still remembers being the poor little kid in Oklahoma. Yeah, I um, we did a we did a show with him during COVID. I remember that. And um, I uh, Victoria Shaw uh, was doing this this thing, and and he was on that show, and I was outside to meet him with a, a mask on, and mm-hmm. you know all of that. And I had some buddies out there uh, that were trying to keep the fans from from just getting all over him, right? Sure. When we got here, and I'll never forget it. He gets out of the he gets out of the car and he looks at me with the mask on, mm-hmm. and he said, "Hey, Chris, I recognize that face. Yep. with a mask on. I know he, and, he's scary and, in that way. Yeah, and then uh, and then you know it wasn't a lot, but it, I would say there's probably eight, ten people that were you know back in this parking lot, mm-hmm. and. You know, and I've, I had some big buddies of mine that were like, you know, bodybuilder kind of guys, right. like being the security, guards. walking him, walking him in. And he's like, hey, guys, I, I need a minute. Yep. And like walks over to him, you know, and just like he took a picture and hugged every single one of those people. I know. And uh, I mean, it's just it's amazing that, um, you know, you are you are at the right place at the right time. And exactly. you guys, uh, you know, all of these years later are still very close friends and. You know. Yeah, there's really nobody like him yeah. I mean, as far as his memory and as far as his uh, honesty and what he does for people. He just showed up at the live hospice show we did at the Bluebird in January and played all the night and then just stayed, I don't know how long, signing autographs for people, even out in the parking lot. And yeah. It's it's amazing. Yeah. We, uh, we stood in the back uh, in the green room here and probably had a 30-minute conversation that, you know, his story with George Strait was – my story was him right that was he was he was my you know the guy that i that i looked up to and the reason i moved to nashville the reason i got into music so it was uh anyway it's it's it was just it's really cool that um you know you've you've had so much success with him so let's let's dive in a little bit more of that so the first song is if tomorrow, if tomorrow never, tomorrow come. never, <laughs> never comes. comes uh and then um you know you guys start writing a lot together mm-hmm. and and what was you know what what was happening after that like just walk me through just well what was happening after that was pretty much nothing uh for either <laughs> one of us he had uh been trying to get a record deal and i had just lost my publishing deal which was real good because uh i own the publishing yeah, on if yeah. tomorrow <laughs> never comes and uh you know, we, we pitched him around town, and we thought we'd written a really good song, and we pitched it around town for about a year, and nobody's interested. And then one night he got to play one song at the Bluebird because an artist who was supposed to show up for a showcase didn't show up. He sang If Tomorrow Never Comes, and Lynn Schultz from Capitol, who was there to hear the other guy, heard him and said, you know, I passed on you three times already, but maybe I missed something. Why don't you come back in? <laughs> Went back in and got a record deal, and... His first single was Much Too Young, and the next one was If Tomorrow Never Comes, and his first number one record. Yeah. and then Amazing. It, and, and then uh, y- you went on to, um, y- you, you've you written, how many how many songs with Garth? You've got Ain't Going Down, If mm-hmm. Tomorrow Never Comes, uh, Somewhere, Somewhere Other Than, other than uh, Night. Midnight uh, Cinderella, She's Going to Make It. Yeah, I, I He's mean, been just, very generous. I think I've had more songs recorded by him uh, than any other writer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. This episode is brought to you by Brit Skin Beauty. Located in the beautiful Indulgence Medi Spa in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, Brittany is the go to esthetician for facials, dermaplaning, microdermabrasion, waxing, lashes, and any skincare products and consultations. So many people in the music industry use her frequently, and her work speaks for itself. To schedule your next consultation or make an appointment, visit BritSkinBeauty.com or send an email to BritSkinBeauty at gmail.com. And then, I mean, you know, you obviously, uh, you know, going back to the to writing poetry and getting a guitar and figuring out like, OK, maybe I should put music to this. You've been extremely successful. I mean, obviously, the, there's the, the Garth uh, stories, but um, you've had you've had cuts by numerous other people right. and, um, you know, several number ones. Um, and uh, one of my one of my favorite songs by Chris Young uh, the black dress song. You know, that's um, my favorite Chris Young song. Yeah, too. I bet it is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, we we have a dear friend Corey Batten. Yep. And so 
Corey is an incredible singer, songwriter, performer, so and he good. wanted a record deal. So we started doing the whole thing of showcases and the whole bit, and um, RCA was interested in him, so we set up a meeting and went down and played him, uh, played them his project, and I knew it wasn't going good because the woman we played it for was watching the worst hundred hurricanes in the last hundred years at the same time. Oh, man. <laughs> and so Corey was kind of disappointed, and... Um, when we left, another a and person came up and said to me, hey, I've got this kid, Chris Young, I'm working with. Uh, we got nothing going on for him. If he doesn't have a hit, he's gone. Would you write with him? And, of course, Corey's standing right next to me. And I said, can I bring Corey? And they said, we don't care what you do. Just write with Chris. So we set up a writing appointment, and he didn't know anything about us, and we didn't know anything about him. And it was one of those days that, songwriters dread where nobody liked anybody else's ideas mm. so i could see Corey starting to sweat because here we have an artist which is hard enough to get with yep. and if he doesn't have a hit he's gone and Corey is a spewer you know you'll be working on something and he's in the other room singing something else and he's also like a, a sixth grader or something when he gets hungry his head goes down on the desk when we're writing i'm like Corey, you need some food yeah Every songwriter's starving, right? <laughs> and so I got where I'd fix him organic hot dogs because they were quick and easy, and he got good at getting the relish and mustard out. And one day he was getting the stuff out of the refrigerator, and I heard him saying, all I can think about is getting you home. And I said, Corey, what is that? He said, I don't know. I just made it up. So I said, make it up in my phone. So I had it in my phone. We got nothing. We're sitting there for a half an hour, 45 minutes, and I said, there's something on my phone that might work. Let me find it. So this was like six months before, and I found it and played it. And Corey said, I love it. And I said, yeah, it's your idea. And Chris said, well, we don't have anything better to write. So we started writing it. And um, we got to the walking through the front door, and none of us could think of what would rhyme with door. And so I said, well, how about seeing her black dress hit the floor? And they turned on me like vipers. Corey said, you're just a dirty old man, <laughs> whatever. And Chris said, well, I'm trying to get on the radio. And I said, well, okay, you guys come up with something better. They didn't. So finally they, they put that in there and we took it down to RCA and they called me the next day and said, we love this. We're going to cut it on Chris. And so the next, uh, week they called up said we cut it we love it it's going to be his first single but we want to change something and i said okay what do you want changed and they said well we like the title getting you home but in parentheses we want to call it the black dress song so i felt like the dirty old man yeah. got vindicated <laughs> and uh it kind of became known as that when it became a hit you know yeah people say play that black dress song and Man, I'd kind of forgotten all about this but uh, as you're telling that story I, I don't know if you were there or not were you were you at the Cummins Station show when Corey was playing that song, it was right after it went number one, um, and I walked on stage? Uh, I don't know. Okay, Keep talking. You, would, you would know. Okay. So I, Were you wearing a black dress? I was. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Were you there? Yep, I yeah. was there. I, I had, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were, we were kind of celebrating Corey and you that night, and, um, and uh, I, uh, a girl. I'm trying I was, to block it out of my yeah, mind. Yeah. You know, but. Well, like I said, I kind of forgot about it too. And right. then I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot I did that. I went that in the funny. back room and put this this tight black dress on. You look good, man. And, and, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think there's a video somewhere, but I remember. There's a video somewhere. Corey is, is jamming the song out. And, mm -hmm. I, and I walked on stage as he's playing it. And everybody's dying laughing, and mm -hmm. I and he never stops, right? Right. And and I go around and I started unbutton his shirt from behind, <laughs> and he just keeps on playing the whole time. Yeah. Lays his head over on my shoulder. I think it was just like he's he's man, a it good. Was, uh, he's such a great improviser, you know. Yeah. that's great. Yeah, that was wonderful. And I think Mason Douglas did that one night at another show too. So. Yeah, I've actually I've got a I've got some videos of Corey and Mason together when we were closing our Franklin spot wow and they were ad-libbing and uh, oh my gosh it's i've got it on youtube somewhere it's like a private link i'll have to find it and send right. it to you but i'd love that yeah there was one night we were doing a show at douglas corner and he'd had this song out if you'd have called yesterday that julie yeah. roberts oh, did. such a good song and he got into this whole spewing thing about uh you know you're gone but that's okay i went and got me a 
a Slurpee today. And I mean, it went on for like 10 minutes. It was just so ad lib and people were falling over in the audience. It yeah. was so funny. And so everybody plays that Slurpee song again. Of course, he'll never do anything again that he did one time. So, yeah. but yeah, crazy guy. Yeah. So, uh, so that's Garth and Chris talk mm -hmm. about some of the other, uh, hits that you've had. Well, the cool thing, the other thing I wanted to bring up that Garth was really good at putting different people together, you know, like everybody thinks we knew each other when we started out, Pat and Tony and Vic and all that. And yeah. we, we kind of did, but, um, Garth called me up one day and what he would do, which I thought was really smart was if we wrote a song or he wrote a song with somebody else, he would play it for other writers and get their feedback. So he calls me one day and he says, um, uh, Hey, I played our song for this kid. A kid was 15 year old, older than him. And he said he hated it, but he liked the line in it. And uh, he thought maybe we could turn it into a song. Would you write with him? And so I'm thinking, well, he hates my song. Yeah, I'll write with him. <laughs> and it ended up being Kim Williams. Mm. And once the three of us got together, there was just a magic there that ended up, I don't know how many songs we wrote together, but you know, four or five number ones. and. And uh, that's the kind of guy he was too. He just kind of would put people together that he thought would work and it yeah. usually worked. And you don't see that very much either. You yeah. know, it's like everybody wants to keep it all in a small area. But, um, you know, I was very lucky. Uh, Diamond Rio did uh, That's What I Get For Loving You. And it didn't go to number one, but it went to two because Midnight.